Manufacturing and supply chains have become essential points of innovation during the global health crisis. John McElhaney is an expert in this topic and a serial entrepreneur. John, tell us about your work at Onshape. I know you were acquired by PTC and tell us what's going on right now with, with you. We started Onshape uh, back in 2012, along with many of the original team from SolidWorks. And the reason we started it, of course, was how people design and build products really had been transformed over the years, but the tools hadn't kept pace. John, supply chain really has become a core issue as all of us try to manage through our daily lives. What were the supply chain strategies that have governed the distribution and manufacturing of goods to date? If you talk to any company that makes things, physical goods, one of the things that people are trying to do from an operational perspective is they're trying to minimize inventory. Because of course, when you have inventory, you know, cash tied up in inventory, you can't invest in other areas of your business. And so if you look at the history, there were sort of several discrete moments in time where supply chains changed. It used to be that you built everything in-house. And then of course, people started looking for specialization and they found suppliers that could invest both in terms of capital and experience in building specific capabilities. And so in the 80s, what you saw was a big shift with, with the purchasing czar, um, uh, Ignacio Lopez. At the time, he was sort of a, a, a real strategist about what to do with supply chains. And so what his philosophy was, let's partner up with one supplier, and then, of course, we'll try and get economies of scale. What that really translated into was basically get the suppliers, put the arm behind their back, and wrench it up to get discounts. And so it drove down the cost of supply goods and ultimately drove the cost of goods down for, for manufacturing. That over time translated from what was defined as partnership to actually true partnerships. And so manufacturers started seeing purchasing and supply chains as strategic. So there was a big shift to just-in-time manufacturing. That is to say, as you're building products to make sure that those, those suppliers delivered sort of sub-assemblies or goods for your manufacturing just in time as you need them. And the idea behind that was, could you get and reduce the slack and push the inefficiencies out of the system and therefore free up the amount of capital that would normally be tied up in inventory and use it for other purposes in your business? So it was really about optimizing the supply chain, getting waste out of the system. And quite frankly, it made many manufacturers economically um, more profitable and, and more efficient. This approach to supply chain was great for manufacturers and, of course, therefore, great for consumers. But then why have we had shortages? Well, it turns out that not only was the idea of just-in-time manufacturing one about reducing kind of waste in the, in the, in the inventory and the supply chain, what people started looking for is additional ways to drive down costs, of course, because we want to increase the purchasing power and the competitiveness of, of the manufactured goods. And so you saw outsourcing uh, to, uh, you know, Far East, to, to China, of course, and now to Vietnam and other countries as well. And so what you started seeing is just-in-time manufacturing, but then you started starting to get a, a push for outsourcing, both, you know, for, for, for sort of, you know, sub-components and sub-assemblies, almost to the end to finish goods where many people would just assemble in the U.S. And so what ended up happening is in the drive for efficiency, we actually created more risk. People didn't realize that, you know, sort of the famous Warren Buffett quote, you know, that you don't realize who's not wearing a bathing suit until the tide goes out. Well, with this health crisis, when supply chains got disrupted, what you started realizing is that many manufacturers could not get their sub-assemblies and the, and the raw goods needed to actually do their manufacturing. So on the drive for efficiency, the pendulum probably swung a little too far. John, as we have strived to... Uh, work out the economics of supply chain and reduce inventories. At the same time, we have created rigidity, making it difficult to change. And so the world has changed right now, and we're kind of stuck. So what's the linkage between efficiency and rigidity? I think you got to kind of raise it up one level a little bit and look at sort of strategically, how do you look at supply chains and suppliers and, and just fundamentally, how are we building products? So I think you're gonna see 
a little bit, you know, the, the reduction of slack in the supply chain actually is going to go and move from JIT or just in time to just in case. I don't think it'll swing to where people have inventories for, you know, for six months worth of inventories, but people are going to start to look at things and segment them by, you know, what's my sole source suppliers? What are my critical, critical uh, elements or natural resources that I need? And, and so you're going to see a little bit more, uh, look at the balance sheets of companies moving forward. You're going to see the inventory line go up because people are going to move to a little bit of just in case. So I think the manufacturers themselves are going to look at their own product development process and probably shift from a gated process to more of an agile process. And the reason is really simple. It allows you to make things you know, quicker, but it allows you to be more adaptable to what the consumer demands are and needs, as well as what are some of the external forces that are impacting your company. So I think this idea of agile design and agile manufacturing, I think is going to start to permeate in how we think about supply chains and the overall product development process. Uh, it's going to be a gradual shift, but I think it's an undeniable shift. But John, you still have the problem of planning that if your manufacturing is set up for one type of product, one type of demand, and now the world changes as it has so rapidly with our world over the last few months, how do you respond and construct your manufacturing and supply chain planning to be agile and to be able to make those shifts very quickly? I think you are going to see strategic relationships continue in the supply chain. Of course, people aren't going to immediately go and, and have you know 10 different suppliers. They're probably going to have one, maybe add a second. And when they talk with their suppliers, they're going to talk with them about a strategic plan that allows for flexibility. You know, I think I remember, you know, perhaps a great example, a way to describe how technology can impact this is I remember visiting a large automotive supplier. And one of the things they had in their in their production floor is they were moving the product along to do uh, to do assembly and, and fabrication. And they literally had cam and followers, meaning they had, you know, kind of things on literally rigid pieces of metal that had been carved out with the path to move, you know, the trails along the way to move the product along the assembly process. Now, th the good news is those things were incredibly reliable, incredibly robust. The problem is if you went from wanting to make an SUV to making a sports car, you know, it's next to impossible when you have physical hard tooling like that. So what you saw, you know, with, with, with microcontrollers and microprocessors invading every aspect of the world, you're seeing stepper motors, you're seeing things that allow for people to have flexibility in their manufacturing process because they're using sort of digital technology and using software to change the configuration to allow for uh, flexibility and, and for additional configurations and adaptability. So I think you're going to see both a strategic process approach and how we look at our suppliers, but you're going to see a technology approach that looks at both hardware in terms of, you know, compute hardware, you know, motors and stepper motors, as well as and, and microprocessors and controllers. And you're going to also see software come into play to be able to help with the adaptability and flexibility. But you still end up having to construct your manufacturing line and anticipate, make certain assumptions about the nature of the world going forward. A great example of a manufactured product adapting to market needs is Zara, the clothing manufacturer. There was a great article in the New York Times, maybe about two and a half years ago about Zara. So Zara makes women's fashion. And if you talk to my wife or daughter, they'll sort of say, when you go to Zara, if you see something you like, you got to buy it now. Because in fact, it may not be here the next time you come back. And so the, the example that was given in this New York Times article, I thought was fascinating. It was around the fall time frame, And they had this woman's cape kind of coat. And they, they had made like, I don't know, 400 of them for their store in, in, in Manhattan. But, but 4,000 or 40,000, I've even forgotten the number, globally. And one of their, their store managers sort of came back after hearing feedback from their customers that's saying, you know, we should have a little hook here that could take the cape to pull it through to lock it. And so she sketched up an idea and sent it back to, to the corporate headquarters at Zara. And between, you know, most of their manufacturing, quite frankly, is, is actually based in Spain. And they quickly iterated on that design, taking the customer feedback, rapidly manufactured it. And in less than two weeks, they had a whole new version of it and sold out in less than a week. So this idea of being able to adapt to customer input is going to be a strategic advantage for customers longer term. And so people are going to look at their supply chains, and they're not going to only just look at cost. 
They're going to look at how quickly can they adapt and help me adapt my business longer term. And I think that's how people, they're going to put a strategic lens when they look at these partners and they look at, 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 at their, their suppliers. That Zara example is quite interesting because the manufacturing business model had a direct impact on the marketing business model. They created exclusivity and their customers know that they need to buy now. If we like this item, buy it now. You're exactly right. Supply chain and manufacturing connected with product design becomes a strategic advantage when you can respond to what the customers want and customers need. And then, of course, in this world of this pandemic and the health crisis that we're facing, again, flexibility. You know, look, we're a software company. Our tools were built to allow users and people to work remotely. I can work from my MacBook. I can use my mobile device. I don't have to be tied to a specific workstation that I have to go to a corporate office to get because it requires, you know, a lot of computing power and a lot of specialty graphics cards. The idea of being able to remotely access things made it a natural flow for this COVID virus. And I think we're already seeing customers respond in kind and, and saying, help us. How do we deal with remote sites? Because people realize that this is not just a one-time event. I'm not you know, forecasting another you know, pandemic. I'm just saying that, that, that this is a, a notable shift in how we think, how we work, how we live. And, and tools that allow for adaptability, flexibility, and supply chains that can match to that will give companies strategic advantage. John, as we finish up, what had advice do you have for senior business leaders on the subject of agility and being able to respond to change? You know, the, the hardest step, of course, is the first step. But if you just start taking some measurable pieces. Don't try to boil the ocean. Pick one part of your supply chain. Pick one part of your product line, but get started. And to do that internally, you know, find somebody that you trust, somebody that you know has the determination to actually make change and make something happen. And then you got to support that person, she or he, to the hilt. Because what will end up happening is organizations will resist that change. But in the end, we all say we want change. And as leaders, our job is to actually make change. So Find people who are good and adaptable and that don't stop. And then pick a something that's measurable and that's consumable. Don't try and boil the ocean and realize that, of course, change is hard. But in fact, that's what we're all paid to do. How can business leaders balance this desire for supply chain and manufacturing efficiency with the obvious need for flexibility and to remain adaptable in their design processes, in their manufacturing, in their supply chains? I think the first is that it has to be a corporate imperative. You know, why are you doing it? Why are you making this change? If it doesn't come from senior leadership, then it's just going to die in the bowels of the company as you try to make some changes. So, and, and then the question is, how do you kind of initiate the activity and get going? I think one of the ways to do that is you may not be able to change your complete supply chain. Try and change one supplier. Try and change how you can work with one supplier and then work on the next one and then work on the next one. Um, you know, this idea of, of just take something that's consumable and make a difference and get some traction. Get a toehold. Once you get a toehold, you can then reach and grab another, another position. George Patton, I think that sort of said, you know, I'll take a uh, 80% and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, I'll take an 80% plan executed, you know, uh, aggressively today than a perfect plan executed two weeks from now. In this crisis, what's very fascinating about it is by necessity and by government edict, we actually had to find a way to make things work while we're, while we're in this quote shutdown. And look at the popularity of remote tools like Zoom and other tools to allow people to function and communicate and also socialize. So, you know, in fact, when you say it can't be done, the short answer is no, it can be done. The question is, do you have the will to get it done? John McElhaney, thank you very much for sharing your insight and expertise with us. Thanks, Michael.